True happiness is not just one thing. Whether we're talking about your experience of happiness in your day-to-day -day life or how your brain produces it, happiness is a dynamic phenomenon and set of brain processes. By understanding how the brain produces happiness, or at least the prerequisites for happiness, we can use that knowledge to improve our daily lives. By the end of this video, my goal is that you will have gained some of this knowledge and with it, the power to be a little happier. We all know intuitively that pleasure has something to do with happiness, but most of us recognize that it cannot be the whole story. In the brain, pleasure is thought to be the result of the activation of certain brain areas called hedonic hotspots, especially areas found deep in the brain, including the nucleus accumbens and ventral pallidum, as well as certain areas of the cerebral cortex, especially the orbitofrontal cortex and the insula. More specifically, it may be that the orbitofrontal cortex and insular cortex are responsible for your conscious experience of pleasure. For example, the taste of delicious food, the sound of beautiful music, or the smell of a cool evergreen forest just after a rainstorm. If you want more in-depth information about the neuroscience of pleasure, check out my video on it. But of course, pleasure is just one piece of the happiness puzzle. Tasty food, good music, wonderful smells, and other sensory pleasures are indispensable, but they can't by themselves explain what it means to live a meaningful life, an examined life, a well-rounded and truly happy life. For that, we need what is often called eudaimonia, or the life well-lived. There are multiple definitions of eudaimonia, but all of them seem to point to a sense of meaning and or purpose, or the fulfillment of our human capacities. This component of happiness is not so easily mapped to specific brain networks, but cutting edge research is beginning to elucidate how the brain allows for this loftier, more purposeful aspect of happiness. One very important point to keep in mind throughout this video is that while pleasure and eudaimonia are different in all the ways I just outlined, it seems that eudaimonia always or mostly contains at least the promise of pleasure. Think about your own experience. While it's obviously possible to have pleasure without eudaimonia, for example, indulging in unhealthy foods for no good reason, it's difficult, at least for me, to imagine eudaimonia without at least the expectation of future pleasure. A woman giving birth, for example, is almost certainly not experiencing any pleasure, but she may think about it as extremely meaningful and deeply important to her life in a eudaimonic sense. But ultimately, isn't the reason she considers giving birth meaningful because there's some positive experience she's looking forward to, such as holding her newborn baby or watching it grow into an independent human being or something like that. I mean, it could even be that she believes that God or someone else simply wants her to have a baby and she gains some kind of positive feeling from pleasing God or that person. Anyway, I'll admit that there are situations where individuals engage in meaningful activities or pursue their values without necessarily experiencing positive feelings or even the absence of negative feelings, either in the short or long term. Regardless, the fact is that most people who rate their lives as highly meaningful also consistently rate their current mood as positive. So at least from this perspective, eudaimonia and pleasure seem to go together. In 2017, two of the world's foremost experts on the neuroscience of pleasure and motivation, doctors Morten Kringlebach and Kent Barrage proposed a model of brain activity that links pleasure and eudaimonia. Specifically, there are two ideas central to this model, the pleasure cycle and optimal metastability. We'll talk about these in turn. The pleasure cycle is this idea that our brains typically process pleasurable experiences in three phases, the appetitive, consummatory, and satiety phases. The appetitive phase is characterized by the motivation to act to gain some kind of pleasurable reward or experience, whereas the consummatory phase is characterized by the achievement of that reward, that is, the pleasurable experience itself. And the satiety phase is characterized by a period of intense learning within the brain about how we got the reward and how to make that more likely again in the future. So let's put this together into an example. Say your favorite author just posted an announcement on her social media pages explaining that her newest book is now available, a book that you've been eagerly anticipating for the last several months. This is the appetitive phase. You are motivated 
in this case, quite consciously, to do what you must to have that book. This phase is probably mediated by the activation of a network of brain regions, including the ventral striatum, which is involved in the feeling of wanting, the orbital frontal cortex, which is involved in the knowledge of how valuable the book and the experience is to you, the cingulate cortex, which is involved in error detection, interoception, and analyzing the effort involved in getting the book, the amygdala, which is important in detecting important features of your immediate environment, which probably includes that notification on your phone about the new Instagram post, and the insula, which is involved in forming a map of the internal sensations of the body and the feeling component of emotion. And finally, the hypothalamus, which is important for facilitating motivated behaviors. Neurochemically, this phase is characterized primarily by higher levels of dopamine and activity of dopaminergic neurons. So with your brain duly motivated, you head to the bookstore to find a copy. Now you enter the consummatory phase. You savor the moment of admiring the cover art turning the book over in your hands and reading the blurb on the back cover. Then finally, you sit down on a nearby bench and start reading. This phase, starting at the point of purchase and extending at least through your first bout of reading, is characterized by an experience of pleasure, of satisfaction, of positive feelings about the book and your ownership of it. This pleasurable experience is likely mediated by the combined activation of various hedonic hotspots, like I mentioned earlier. Those include subcortical regions like the ventral pallidum, as well as cortical regions like the insular cortex and the orbital frontal cortex, which are involved in the experience of pleasure. Okay, now the satiety phase. So some time passes, the initial glow of the newness of the book begins to fade and the ecstatic enjoyment you felt comes back down to a more neutral, normal level. Now your brain is undergoing a period of learning. The learning process is about getting you to do something similar in the future. At this point, the activity of the pleasure generating hedonic hotspots tends to go down and the activity of brain regions involved in various types of memory tends to go up. For example, the medial temporal lobe, which includes the hippocampus, which is a brain region crucial for forming new memories of experiences and the amygdala, which is involved in the behavioral conditioning and emotional memory formation. Synapses are being altered and neural pathways are being strengthened, all in the service of making you more likely to do what caused the pleasant experience again in the future. One important caveat here is that I've been talking like all of this is happening in conscious awareness, but that's not always the case. For example, in psychological priming experiments where researchers present subjects with subliminal stimuli that can affect their mood and behavior without them knowing, this may lead to learning via the process just discussed. Okay, so now that we understand the pleasure cycle, let's talk about that second piece of the puzzle, the idea of optimal metastability and what it has to do with eudaimonia in particular and happiness in general. In the normal course of brain function, Various brain regions activate in synchrony because they're linked such that the activity of one brain region can influence the activity of another. Metastability is a quantitative measure of how that synchronization fluctuates over time. According to the authors, optimal metastability is when, quote, an optimal point is reached between the fast and slow processing characterizing human cognition. Kringlebach and Berridge suggest that optimal metastability primarily in the brain's default mode network, may represent the neurological basis of eudaimonia, and it may provide clues to the elusive connection between pleasure and eudaimonia. To explain this in more detail, we need to first understand the link between the default mode network and pleasure. For that, I want to quote the authors at length. They write, quote, We have previously shown that many of the key regions of the pleasure system are part of the brain's default mode network a key resting state network that is most active when we are not directly engaged in tasks. There is also an emerging literature proposing that the default mode network supports representations of self, internal models of cognition, and perhaps even states of consciousness. We have previously speculated that the default mode network may play a role in connecting eudaimonic and hedonic happiness to the self." End quote. Let's look at the author's hypothesis regarding how optimal metastability may be linked to eudaimonia. 
The idea is that eudaimonia might result from there being an optimal flow of information in the pleasure system and connected emotion processing networks, possibly including the default mode network. They write that this could underlie, quote, the feelings of subjective well-being and flow anecdotally reported after a deeply meaningful experience. It's important to note that these ideas are still based on limited empirical evidence and more research is needed to further understand the complex relationship. Okay, now that we've got an understanding of some of the relevant science on happiness, here are some strategies you can employ in your own life to increase your own happiness and well being. First, define your values. To enhance happiness, it is crucial to have a clear understanding of your personal values as they provide a sense of direction and purpose in life. When you're aware of your core values, you can make choices and they engage in activities that align with them, which can lead to a greater sense of eudaimonia or living a life well lived. Spend some time reflecting on what is most important to you, such as family, career, personal growth, or helping others. Get specific. Identify the values that resonate the most with you and use them as a guide in making decisions and setting goals. By living in accordance with your values, you will likely experience increased happiness as you create a life that is both pleasurable and meaningful, perhaps bringing your brain into a state of optimal metastability. Next, participate in activities that bring you joy and satisfaction, like enjoying a hobby or listening to music or spending time with loved ones. By activating the pleasure centers in the brain, you can increase your overall happiness. Of course, these activities should not be guilty pleasures, but instead activities that you enjoy and do not conflict with your goals. One of the greatest and most unintuitive sources of pleasure is in helping deserving people who are in need. As the neuroscientist and podcaster Sam Harris put it, quote, this is where so-called self-sacrifice becomes the wiser form of selfishness. If you really just want to be happy, if that's your goal, one fairly wide doorway into that is to be very rigorous about using your energy in a consciously pro-social way to improve the lives of others, end quote. In other words, it's only self-sacrifice if you're really sacrificing what matters to you. And third, pursue eudaimonia through meaningful experiences. This probably involves moving toward the career path that you most want to be on. It can also involve pursuing personal growth, contributing to the community, developing deep connections with others, and most likely all three of those. By participating in activities that promote eudaimonia, you can experience a greater sense of happiness and well being. Okay, let's summarize this video. True happiness is a dynamic phenomenon involving multiple brain states and prerequisites. Pleasure is a component of happiness, but not the whole story. Hedonic hotspots in the brain, for example, the nucleus accumbens, ventral pallidum, orbitofrontal cortex, and insula are responsible for pleasurable experiences. Eudaimonia, or the life well lived, involves a sense of meaning and purpose. The neuroscience of eudaimonia is less clear, but research is underway to better understand its underlying brain processes. Kringlebach and Barrage proposed a model of brain activity linking pleasure and eudaimonia through two central ideas. The pleasure cycle, which consists of three phases, the appetitive, consummatory, and satiety phases, and optimal metastability. Optimal metastability may represent the neurological basis of eudaimonia. The default mode network may play a role in connecting eudaimonic and hedonic happiness to the self. And finally, more research is needed to understand the complex relationships between pleasure, eudaimonia, and happiness in the context of neuroscience. All right, well, that is it. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Sense of Mind. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. But if you really want to help me to continue to make videos like this, please become a patron on Patreon, and you'll get exclusive access to live streams as well as written versions of all new videos, including this one. So go to patreon.com slash sense of mind to sign up. And finally, if you want to stay up to date with sense of mind, sign up for the email newsletter at senseofmindshow.com slash newsletter. Okay. Thanks again. I'll catch you next time.